Okay, welcome to Word Without Walls. Welcome to the Tuesday Night Sunlight Service. This is Gripped by Grace, Part 6. And last week we kind of talked about growing in grace, and we looked at what that means in regard to the heaven and the earth passing away, and the elements being burned up with the fire. And we looked at the great noise that, that was the mighty rushing wind of the Holy Spirit, and we looked at the fire that is God consuming us and leaving us only with righteousness and holiness left. So, to kind of piggyback onto that, tonight we're going to look at grace to grow. Because I think that's a big part of grace, is knowing that you can make mistakes. Knowing that it, 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 it no longer does God relate to us in terms of our actions. Now on this side of the cross in the New Covenant, God relates to us solely and completely on His nature. And that's why it's so important for us to understand that He has given us His nature. He has gotten rid of the beast nature. He got our goat on the cross. He separated the sheep and the goats, leaving only the sheep, which is Jesus, which is us, so that He could deal with us on, on, on a, a, a level that is equal. And that's, again, what we started this whole series with, was, was grace is what allows us to agree with God, to see Him as He truly is, and to see ourselves as He sees us, as we truly are. And then when we agree with God, we can walk with God. But the thing about walking with God is that you, you are not disqualified from doing that. If you stumble, if you fall, that's no longer how it is. It's no longer you have to act a certain way in order to be approved. Now it has become, because of grace, now it has become you are approved and now you're also empowered to act a certain way, to behave a certain way, to go around doing good just as Jesus did because it's Jesus doing that good in you. So I kind of want to take a little bit of a different uh, approach to this one today. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about Jesus. Because if we're focusing on ourselves, we've missed the whole entire point. If I'm saying I have grace to grow and that means that I can make mistakes, then we've missed it. Because it's not about the mistakes I made, it's not about what I do, it's not about me having grace, it's about the personification of grace that is Jesus living his life in me. It's all about him. So that's what we're going to look at today, and uh, we're going to start in Proverbs chapter 24, and I, I kind of reference the Proverbs 24, 16, which we're going to get to kind of a lot of times. And then the last time I referenced it afterwards, I thought, man, I really need to kind of explain this. I really need to, to go through this and qualify this. Because, uh, well, I'll read the last verse and then we'll back up and then we'll move back down to it. Proverbs 24, verse 16 says, For a just man falleth seven times and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. And here's the thing, again, we have to understand. I'm not the just man who falls and gets back up. Jesus is. Jesus is the just man. The Bible is talking about Jesus. But the last time I said that, I thought afterwards, I was like, wait a minute, people are probably going to wonder, well, hold on, when did Jesus fall? When did Jesus mess up? All these different things. Because as we know, Jesus knew no sin. But here's, here, here's what I need to explain about that first things first is, sin is not what you do. Sin is what you believe. Jesus knew no sin. Jesus knew no unbelief. Jesus knew who he was and who the Father was at all times. And that's the difference that we get into is we look so much at ourselves. We look so much at our own actions that we think, man, if I keep falling, how am I just? And it's not about you falling. It's not about you being just. It's about Jesus and what he did on the cross and what it means for us. So let's back up a few verses. I want to start in Proverbs 24 with verse 13. In Proverbs 24, 13, in the King James it reads, My son, eat thou honey, because it is good, and the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. Now, before we even really get into this, the land of milk and honey, the promised land, and we're going to talk about milk a little bit later, it's about milk is righteousness and honey is revelation. So what we're seeing here in Proverbs, he's saying, eat thou honey. He's saying you need this revelation. You need to eat Jesus. You need to eat the bread and the wine. You need to understand that we're not talking about you. We're talking about him. And if that's where our focus is, then, then really we've already won the battle. There's no more fight that needs to be fought, but, but when we know it and we believe it, 
then what's true becomes true for us. And how we do that is by being on the right diet. Because again, you know, you are what you eat, or, or spiritually speaking, you are what you believe. So we're starting right off the bat on this by saying, eat thou honey because it is good. And the honeycomb, which is sweet to thy taste. And I like that they put how honeycomb is sweet, because when you really start to understand Jesus, when you really start to have that, that experiential relationship with him, that father-son relationship with God, then you understand that this is the best thing going. There's a way that we think it is. There's a way that it may have been before the cross. And there's a way that it is now. There's a more excellent way. And if we eat this honey, if we drink this milk, if we fill ourselves with Jesus, if we eat his flesh and drink his blood, all of these different pictures the Bible has are basically get Jesus in you because he's already in you. Be filled with what you're already filled with. When we do that, then we get to partake of his divine nature. Then we get to partake of the kingdom that we've been placed in. Then we get to walk in who we really are rather than struggling in, in, in trying to be somebody because we don't know who we are. So that's what I wanted to say about the honeycomb being sweet and about this, this, this eating this honey is so important. It says in verse 14, So shall the knowledge of wisdom be unto thy soul. And again, that's why I equate honey with revelation. If you eat the honey, you get the knowledge of wisdom. If you eat the honey of the... If you eat what the promised land provides for you, the promised land that is rest, that is Jesus, if you eat that six-course meal that he has prepared for you, if you feast totally and completely on him, then, then you gain him, so to speak, even though we already have him, understand that. But, but when we really start to come into the fullness of this, when we really start to understand all of this, when we really start to be who we are, rather than trying to be somebody else, it's about really just... Just eyes on Jesus. Focus on Jesus. Make that shift away from yourself, who is dead anyway, onto Jesus, who, who lives not only for us, but who lives in us. So it's all about that shift of, of you know, how do I make what's true, true for me? You eat the milk, you, or you, you, you drink the milk, you eat the honey, you drink the wine, you eat the bread, you eat the lamb, you, you get on the right diet, and then your, your physical health, your spiritual health, all of that flows from there. So it says, when thou hast found it, then there shall be a reward, and thy expectation shall not be cut off. And I've been thinking a lot about this lately, kind of uh, really kind of meditating on this lately, is about hope. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. If we're hoping for something, if we're hoping to get something that we don't think we have, then it's almost up in the air. Then it's almost like, yeah, well, maybe I'll get there and maybe I won't. But what it says here is when you eat the honey, then you will find what you've been looking for. Then you will have the reward. You, you Really, you will be the reward. And your expectation will not be cut off. You will understand that I am who I need to be. I am where I need to be. I have everything I need to have because I have Jesus. Because I am part of his many-membered body. Because I am one flesh with him. Because he has gripped me by his grace. And now it's not about me finding it anymore. It's about him revealing himself to me. And that's what he's doing when he's preparing this, this, this meal of milk and honey for us. He's revealing himself to us. He's standing at the door and knocking. And all we have to do is open the door and eat the supper that he has prepared. So in verse 15 it says, Lay not wait, O wicked man, against the dwelling of the righteous. Spoil not his resting place. And again, we're not talking about some people are wicked, some people are righteous. We're talking about this struggle that we so often find in ourselves when we're focusing on ourselves. When we think, I'm wicked or I'm doing wicked things, when uh, the New Testament says, when, when, when we were sometimes alienated and enemies in our minds because of our wicked works, we think we're wicked and we think that separates us from God. But he's saying, don't let that spoil your resting place. Don't let thinking that you have to do something to earn something take you out of rest. He's saying, don't focus on yourself, focus on Jesus. Let the, let, let the old man who's dead and buried, let him be buried. Reckon yourself dead. Stop focusing on the wrong thing. Stop eating from the wrong tree. Get off the wrong diet and onto the right diet. He's saying uh, the, the, the dwelling of the righteous is his resting place. 
And we talk about this a lot even in, in the Lamp Swipe series, when, when we finally understood that our bed does nothing for nobody, my bed does nothing for anybody, but our bed, the Lamb and his wife's bed, is green and it produces life because he is in it. He is in us and that's what produces the, the, the fruit that we are supposed to bear or to carry or to receive and release. So again, it's never about, oh, I'm wicked and I need to you know change my behavior. Instead, it's about don't let those wicked thoughts, don't let that old nature that you don't have anymore, don't let that stuff creep in and spoil your resting place. Don't get moved out of rest by thinking I have to do something in order to get it. Because then, you know, what that really says, bottom line, is that if you think you have to do something to get something from God, then you don't believe that you already have it. And you're not resting in the assurance of the finished work that says you already have it, you already are it. So then we go to verse 16 again, which says, For a just man falleth seven times, and riseth up again, but the wicked shall fall into mischief. And what's important here, again, talking about Jesus, is seven is the number of perfection in the Bible. And that's going to be really, really, really important when we get to our next passage. But here's the deal. Don't let that, the, see, again, the wicked man, or, or, or the, the beast nature, or the, the I have to do something to get something nature, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, it's going to make you fall into mischief if you think I have to do something to get God's love. It's, you will literally rob yourself of the love that is freely given if you're trying to earn it instead of simply receiving it. And if you're focused on you, then you've missed it because Jesus said, no man comes to the Father but by me. He says there's only one way to have this relationship, this Father-Son love relationship with God, and it's, through the, it's literally through the Son. You have to be the Son in order for God to be your Father. And that's why Jesus drew us all into himself. That's why Jesus gave us the Holy Spirit, our love receptor, which, which empowers us to be who we really are, which cries in our hearts, Abba, Father, and it gives us that relationship. So we're going to look at Jesus falling seven times and rising back up. We're going to look at Jesus doing everything that was needed, not only for his perfection, but for our perfection. And that takes us to Hebrews chapter 5. And I have the whole chapter uh, underlined here. It's only 14 verses, but this is where we're going to spend most of our time today. And then uh, I want to uh, I want to kind of end with a story about Jesus actually uh, putting this into practice, as it were. So Hebrews chapter five, and I just want to read it in the King James because I have a couple lengthy passages, and I don't want to be super lengthy, but. Hebrews 5 in the King James, it reads like this. For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men in things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity? So he's saying, uh, before the cross, the way that it was, was you would... God would choose a high priest from among the people, and that high priest would kind of stand in for the people, and he could have compassion on them because he, you know, if, if I was to be ordained a high priest, I've gone through all of the same kinds of stuff that you've gone through, or, or, or at least some of it. Like, I understand what you're going through because I'm going through it too. I'm compassed with the same infirmity. And in verse 3 it says, And by reason hereof he ought, as for the people, so also for himself, to offer for sins. So again, it's this identification. It, it, it's, okay, I have to make offerings for your sins, but I have my own sins too that I need to take care of. We're all in this together type of deal. That's how it used to be. And it says uh, in verse 4, And no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So again, he's, he's, he's saying, listen, I'm choosing, I used to choose from among you, but it was my choice. I picked the guy. God's saying again, it's not about what you can do, it's about what I empower you to do. It's about what I call you to do. And, and when God calls you to do something, He always empowers you to do it. Because really, he, He's willing to do it, willing and able to do it in you and through you. He doesn't call you to do something and then say, alright, good luck, I hope you don't screw up. Even with Moses, even with Aaron, God chose Moses, but Moses didn't want to do what he was called to do. And he gave all these excuses. 
And God said, you know what, all right, if you say you can't talk very well, I'm going to put your brother with you who can talk well, who is a good speaker, and then you're, I'm going to leave you with no excuses. I'm literally going to give you everything that you need to do what I've called you to do. And that is still how he does it today, except to, today, as we're going to see, he doesn't give us Aaron. Today he gave us Jesus. He gave us his son. He gave us himself. And that's what it says in verse 5 of Hebrews 5. It says, So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So, so, so what, what the writer of Hebrews is saying here, he's saying, Jesus didn't exalt himself. Jesus didn't puff himself up. In fact, there was a time when, when Jesus literally walked the earth and the people came and they wanted to make him king by force. And Jesus slipped out of their midst and he said, this isn't it. This isn't what we're doing. It's not about what you guys necessarily want it, with, with your natural, unregenerated, carnal minds. It's about what God wants. When God elevates me, that's when it's time for me to be elevated. And of course, that time when he was elevated was when he was literally elevated onto the cross. That's when he drew us all into himself. So it says in verse 6, continuing the thought, it says, As he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So again, we're seeing a shift in even in the priesthood, where, where before the cross it was the Levitical priesthood, it was the priesthood of Aaron, and it was all the sacrifices and all the laws and all of those things. But in the new covenant, we now have a different high priest who was not of that Levitical system, who was not of that old covenant system, but instead he's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. He, he, and the thing about Melchizedek was that he was a king and a priest. And that's what it says in different places in the New Covenant, in Revelations, I think in Peter. It talks about how we are now that same uh, nation uh, of royalty of priests. We are now the king priests. We are now Jesus. We are now God in the flesh. We are now love in a body. And we have now been empowered and equipped both to rule as a king and to minister as a priest. So again, the what God wants to happen on this earth, he's doing it through us. He first did it through Jesus, and now Jesus is in us. So, so really, he's continuing to do it through Jesus, just on a larger scale. So in verse 7, it says, Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications, with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death, and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, this is where I wanted to get verse 8. This, this is what can I expect to uh, Proverbs 24. Talking about Jesus, it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. So Jesus had a maturation process. God in the flesh literally went through the human experience. He was a baby. He pooped in his diaper. He threw up on stuff. He had the whole entire human experience. And he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And, and, and we're not talking about the passion here. We're not talking about Jesus suffering on the cross here. Because that word suffer is number 3958 in Strong's Creek Concordance. And it means experience or feel. So Jesus learned obedience by the things he experienced. He learned obedience by the things that he felt. And, and what Jesus felt more than anything in the Bible is he felt compassion for people. And he learned from that. He learned what to do with all of the love that he was full with by encountering people that needed that love. He, again, he went around doing good, not to please the Father, but because he knew the Father was already pleased. Jesus didn't do any ministry at all until after the Holy Spirit rested on him and, and Daddy said, you're my son in whom I'm well pleased. So, so again, it's a whole different order where, where, where the Levitical priesthood had to earn everything, had to work hard at everything, had to make all these sacrifices over and over again. And, and then Jesus comes in a totally different priesthood, as a totally different high priest, and he comes and God says, I'm putting my stamp of approval on you. I'm declaring who you are. I'm declaring your identity not only to you but to everybody else so that you can live out of who you are rather than trying to be somebody that you think you're not. And again, that's what it means to be gripped by grace. It means seeing God as he truly is so we can see ourselves as we truly are. It means the divine influence on the heart and its reflection in our lives. What grace really means is God in us, Christ in us, love in us, 
and the ability to use what we've been given, the ability to receive it and release it. So in verse 8 again, talking about Jesus, it says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And in verse 9 it says, And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. So again, you know, I'm not saying that Jesus ever wasn't perfect, but I'm saying he learned how to be who he was. Just in the same way that we don't need to become anything. We need to find out what we are, who we are. And when we find that out, again, by drinking the milk, by eating the honey, when we find out who we, when we find out who he really is, then we can find out who we really are. When we see him as he really is, we will start to be him as he really is because he is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. And again, what does obeying him mean? It means following the commandment it, it, that he gave. It means first believing in him, and it means love one another as Jesus loves us. That's what new covenant obedience is. Receive his love until you're so full of it that it comes out of you naturally. That's our new nature. No longer a beast nature. No longer a goat nature. No longer an Adam nature. But a Jesus nature. A love nature. A nature that is, is really the true nature. That, that we can see clearly because we're not stumbling around in the dark. But because the light of the world is shining in us. So it says in verse 10 called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So again, here, here's kind of the, here's the um, journey here. Was he was a son, he was always a son, he was literally born of a woman in the Holy Spirit. There was never a time when Jesus was not the son of God. But he learned obedience by the things that he experienced, and he was made perfect. He fell seven times and got back up every time and came into perfection both for us and as us, so that he could be the author of eternal salvation, so that he could be called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. So, so in some ways, he, he even fulfilled all of the Levitical order. He even fulfilled all of, ever, all, all of the commandments, all of the law, all of everything, by literally becoming who we were and doing what we could not do both for us and as us, by wrapping us up in himself and saying, listen, you can't do this without me, so I'm going to do it for you and as you, and then it's going to be done, and then we can move forward into something new, into a new heaven, a new earth, a new promised land, in, 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 into the true paradise of God, new Jerusalem, which, which is not only where we are, but who we are, so we can have the days of heaven on earth, because Jesus, who is heaven, lives in our earth, because of everything that he did, now we can be everything that he is. And it says in verse 11, Of whom we have many things to say, and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. And, and again, this just goes back to, unless you have ears to hear, unless you have eyes to see, unless you're willing to receive this, it, it doesn't really mean anything. It's like the white stone that has a name written on it, that nobody knows except him that receives it. You can't figure out what it means to be Jesus until you allow the Holy Spirit to teach you what it means, to lead and guide you into all truth. That's the only way this thing can work. And, and, and again, I'm convinced that, that the only way anybody's going to ever be open to God's love without knowing that they have the Holy Spirit is by seeing it, is by feeling it, is by experiencing it. And in that same way, they will learn obedience by the things that they suffer or experience. If we give them love and they experience love, they will learn of God's love. But it's only through that love that you can truly see the Father as He is. And you can't give that love until you receive that love. So it starts with us who have received it. It starts with us who know who we are. Just simply being who we are. Just simply shining our light among men. Just simply loving people the same way that Jesus loves us. Because when we do that, then instead of judging people and saying, look how many times you fell down, then you can say, hold on a second, it doesn't matter how many times you fell down, Jesus fell down, but he got up every time. Jesus perfected himself and us in himself. Jesus did it all so we could get it all, and the all that we get is love. And that's what we have, so that's what we have to give. 
So in verse 12 it says, For when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. So again he's saying, Here's the problem, guys. We have this, but we're not acting like we have this. We know this, but we're not walking in this. We should be teaching this stuff, but instead, it's like it, it, it's like we're we're going right back to the beginning. And you know, this kind of sounds harsh, and sometimes it does in the Bible. But but I don't think the beginning is a bad place to start. I think wherever you're at, the beginning can be a good place to recalibrate or to renew your mind. I think going back to this milk. Just, just simply knowing that you are righteous because the righteous one lives in you. I think that's the foundation that we need to lay. I think the only, Paul said the only foundation that we can build on is the foundation that has been laid, which is Jesus. So anytime we start to, you know, as it said in Proverbs, anytime the, the, the wicked man, who doesn't really exist anymore, tries to crop up his head, all we have to do is we have to stay in our rest. We have to stay with what we know. We have to understand that the righteousness of God, the milk, and the revelation of Jesus, the, the honey, is what sustains us. It's what keeps us. It's, it, it, it's what empowers us to keep going, as it were, no matter what comes against us. So he says, For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. And again, that's why I equate milk with righteousness. Because he's saying, if, if you're going back to the start, you're not skilled with the word of righteousness. Which doesn't mean you don't have it, which doesn't mean you're not righteous. It just means you don't know what it means to be who you are. It just means, listen, we need to get back to basics sometimes. And even if he puts this in a negative connotation, I'm not putting it in a negative connotation. Because I understand that wherever we are, the, the, the best place that we can be, the, the easiest way to renew your mind, as it were, is just to go right back to the word of righteousness. Just to go right back to the finished work and see what Jesus did for us and as us and what it means. To see him as he is so we can know who, who we really are. So, you know, in, in, in some cases, that's okay to be a babe. Jesus said, unless you have faith like a child, you, you can't even enter into the kingdom. So, I'm not saying that we shouldn't grow up, I'm not saying that we shouldn't mature, but I'm saying if, if, if you ever need anything, you need to go to the milk and the honey. You need to go to the bread and the wine or, or the living water. Jesus said, he that hungers and thirsts after righteousness will be filled. And again, I believe he was talking about himself, but, but we can appropriate that for ourselves. We can apply that to ourselves when we say, where does this hunger and thirst for righteousness come from? It comes from the righteous one within me. It comes from the deep calling out to the deep and knowing where to be filled. It comes from if I feel unloved, I know where to go to get that love. I go straight to the source. I don't look for love in all the wrong places. And that's what we're going to talk about next. Is about, again, perfection or, or, or perfect love which casts out all fear. It has to come from Jesus because that's, his, that, that, that's not just what he does. That's who he is. So, verse 14 says, But strong meat belongeth to them that are full of age, even those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So again, he's saying that, you know, this, this is a journey, but it's not a journey of getting anything, it's a journey of understanding what we have. When, when, once you get back on the milk, then you can move on to the meat, you can move on to the deeper stuff, you can really start to understand some of the things that were hidden, because the Bible says, you know, it's the glory of the Lord to hide a thing, and it, it, it's the honor of kings to search a thing out, something like that it says. And then we find that the thing that was hidden was a treasure in an earthen vessel. The thing that was hidden was our life is hid with Christ in God. So what we're really searching for is we're searching for our true selves, and the only place we can find it is in Jesus. That's the heavy stuff, that's the meat stuff, but it starts with this foundation of, Righteousness. I'm righteous. I have grace. It's not about my actions. It's about my identity. It's not about the, the, the outward appearance. It's not about the flesh. It's not about what I do. It's about who I really am. And when I understand who I really am, that's going to automatically and, and effortlessly change what I do. I'm telling you, I think I've said this before, but the biggest compliment I ever got in my life was when somebody told me that somebody else said this about me. They said, 
I don't need to go to church to know God's love. I see it in Tom every day. And that's what this is about. It's not about coming to church. It's about taking church wherever you go. It's not about taking your shoes off because you're standing on holy ground. It's about, no, 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 you have holy feet. Wherever you go is holy ground because you are the holy one. You are the one who, who, who causes the, the darkness to flee just by showing up because you're a lighthouse, because the light of the world shines in you. And wherever you go, there can't be any darkness. How could there be if you're shining the light? Just like the Bible says about God, it says He is light and there's no darkness in Him at all. How could there be? Because where there is light, darkness flees. It has to. So that's what this is all about. It's not about what I do. It's about who I am. It's about who Jesus is in me. So let's turn to John chapter 4. And I actually have a lot to say here. I want to read a lot of this story in John 4 about the woman at the well. That's what we're talking about here. Understanding again that that so many times in our life because we're looking for what we already have, because we think it matters how many times we fall down, because we're trying so hard to 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 do something in order to be something, we get lost, we get stuck. We try to draw from a well that does not have what it is that we're thirsty for. And that's what we're going to see here in John chapter 4. Starting with verse 6, it says, Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. And again, what we see right off the jump of this story, Jesus was tired. Jesus was wearied. Jesus was a man just like we are. Jesus was not some like... Like, superhuman, I never make a mistake, I never mess up, I, I, I just float through life. Even when, he, you know, even when he, he walked out to the discipleships, he didn't float over the water, he walked on the water. He did everything that we did, he just took it to another level. He just lived the same life that we have, yet more abundantly. And that's what he came to give us. So again, it's not about being holy to the point that you're not human. It's about understanding that holiness is being human the way that humans were intended to be not a fallen man not a fallen dimension not a cursed earth world but instead a true paradise of god where there's one tree in the midst of the garden and it's the tree of life that's what jesus came to give us that's what he is that's what he gave us when he gave us himself so he's weary and he gets to this well and then in verse 7 it says there cometh a woman of samaria to draw water jesus saith unto her Give me to drink. For his disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat. Now, this broke just about every rule in the law that you could think of to break. You weren't supposed to talk to women. You certainly weren't supposed to talk to Samaritans. And Samaritan women to a Jew, really, they, they didn't exist. They weren't people. You didn't talk to them. You didn't ask them for anything. So again, when we see that Jesus knew no sin, Jesus broke the law all the time. Sinning is not breaking the law unless you're in the Old Covenant. And Jesus came to fulfill the Old Covenant and to give us the New Covenant. Jesus knew no sin, not because He never broke the law, but because He knew no unbelief. He lived by a higher law. He lived by the perfect law of liberty. He learned this obedience through all these things that He experienced. He had grace right from the jump. Because the Bible says in another place that the law was given by Moses. And by the way, it doesn't say the law was given to you. Because unless you're Jewish, the law was never given to you. It says the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came with Jesus. Because he is grace and truth. So again, it's not about how we thought it used to be. It's about Jesus, period. So Jesus starts breaking laws left and right by talking to this woman. And then in John 4 verse 9, it says, Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest Drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria. For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Even the Samaritan woman, she knows that Jesus is not doing what Jews usually do. She's like, hold on a second. This doesn't make sense to me. Why are you even talking to me? What's going on here? And then in verse 10 it says, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, Thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. 
So again, he's going right back to this principle. He's saying, I will never ever ask you to do anything that I'm not going to empower you to do. If you really knew who you were talking to, if you knew who it was that was speaking a word into your life, then you wouldn't be worried about all these rules. You wouldn't be worried about all these laws. You wouldn't be worried about what God's asking you to do. You would instead go straight to the source to get what you needed. And you would say, you know what, God, if you want water for me, the only place that I can get it is from you. Because all good and perfect gifts flow down from the Father of lights to, to us, the, the sun, the light. The light comes from the source and it shines in us. So he's saying it's, it, it's not about, I want some water from you. What it's really about is, if you want water, you have to get it from me. And then in verse 11, the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? She puts it right back in terms of, well, in order to get water, you have to draw it out of the well. In order to find what you're looking for, you have to put some effort into it. You have to earn everything you get. She's even, she's got that, that, that human, old covenant, you get what you deserve mindset. She's even talking to Jesus and she's saying, listen, what are you going to do? You're, you're sitting there resting on the well and you think water's just going to magically appear? No, no, no. You have to do something in order to get something. And then she says in verse 12, Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? And then in verse 13, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. He's saying, you're coming at this from an inferior covenant. You're coming at this from an inferior mindset. There's a more excellent way. If you drink natural water that you've earned, you're going to get thirsty again. That's, that, that's, that's the cycle and the bondage that religion, that the law puts you in. That's why the Levitical priesthood, every single year, they had to bring your sins to remembrance so that you could make an offering for them, so you could feel bad about them, so you could apologize and confess and, and, and jump through all these hoops in order to be sanctified and clean. But then when Jesus came, he said in another place to the disciples, he said, you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And what was the word that Jesus spoke? It's, it, it, I believe it's the only word that God ever speaks, and it's let there be light. It's love. It's, listen, you're not who you think you are. You're who God says you are. You're not the, the, the sum total of your actions. You are the, 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 the body of the living God. So he says, if you, keep, if you stay stuck in this system and in this bondage, you're going to keep running around in circles. You're going to keep banging your head against the wall, and the only thing that comes from banging your head against the wall is a headache. He says, you have to stop worrying about this well that I'm sitting on, and you have to start looking for what you want at the source. Because if you're not looking for it at the source, you're not going to find it. If God is light, then, then if you're not with him, you're in darkness. Not because he's angry, not because it's punishment, but simply because there's only one place that you can find the light, and, it, and it's him. And again, that's why he said, no man comes to the Father but by me. He wasn't saying, you guys are all in big trouble if you don't accept me. He's saying, if you want what I have, this is how you get it. He says, you come through the door into the sheepfold. He says, you enter into rest by letting rest, or Jesus, enter into you. So again, he was just, he was always trying, he was never trying to condemn us. He was always trying to show us this more excellent way. And that's what he says in verse 14 of John 4. He says, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into eternal life. So he said, I don't need to draw from anything. I am the well. I am the water. I am the eternal life. And when I get into you, I'm going to fill you up so much that you're not going to need to draw any more water. Either what it's going to do is it's going to spring up out of you. It's going to be, you're going to be so full of this living water that it's going to come flowing out of your belly. It's going to come flowing out of your heart. It's going to be so big when you finally start to see the scope of this thing that you're not going to be able to hold it in if you tried. And you're certainly not going to need to keep looking for it once you find it. Once you find what you're looking for, you stop looking. I mean, that even makes sense to, to the natural, unregenerated, carnal mind. You don't say, hey, I found my glasses, I'm going to keep looking for them. You say, hey, I found my glasses, now I can see. And that's what Jesus is in this picture. He is the fulfillment of what we've been looking for. He is the love that we always yearned for but could not believe that we already had. He came and he said, you've always had it, now I'm going to empower you to receive it. 
So, and again, that's what he's talking about with eternal life. That's what this living water is. That's what it does. It, it, it goes right along with, with, with the theme of you are what you eat. If you drink of this living water, if you drink of this Jesus, then it, it, it springs up in you into everlasting life. Then the everlasting life that we've given can now start to be lived by letting him live his life in us. So in verse 15 it says, The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. So, listen, this is how the gospel works. It's not called turn or burn. It's called, listen, if you offer something, somebody something better than they have, they're going to want it. Jesus says, stop worrying about that. Well, I have water that, that, that's better. I have water that if you drink it, you're not going to get thirsty again. And immediately she says, okay, give me that. I want that. That's what I've been looking for. I'm so tired of all of this rat race. I'm so tired of trying so hard to get something that will satisfy me. And Jesus says, here it is. And she says, okay, let me have it. And Jesus says, kind of, kind of strangely, in verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, go call thy husband and come hither. So, so, so basically he almost kind of just changes the subject. And, and, and he starts calling her out on things, and, and he says, go get your husband. He doesn't give her the water right away. So he offers it to her, and she wants it, and then he says, go get your husband. And I think a big part of this goes right back to the Garden of Eden, where Eve was deceived, and Adam wasn't there to cover her. The soul made the wrong choice, as it were, and the spirit wasn't there to check it, as it were. Which, again, on this side of the cross, we've, we've totally moved out of that whole dimension where we're struggling spirit against soul and, and, and we've come to realize that we are full of the Holy Spirit at this point but I think Jesus was trying to show something here. I think Jesus was, was, was doing something in order to you know really explain himself in, in, in a more real way. So he says go get your husband and come back and in verse 17 the woman answered and said I have no husband. Jesus said unto her thou hast well said I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband, and that saidest thou truly. So this woman who is looking for this living water, this woman who is looking for love in all the wrong places, she's trying to draw it from a well that cannot satisfy her. All of a sudden we find out she's had six husbands, or, or five husbands, and, and now she's living with a guy. She's fallen six times. And, and just like seven is the number of perfection, six is the number of man. Six is, what we can, six is what we can accomplish all by ourselves. And it's nothing. Because she is not satisfied. She is not happy. She is still looking for something. She's gone through all these different experiences, but she didn't learn obedience. All she learned was heartbreak. All she learned was rejection. All, what she has learned from her experience, the grace that she had to grow, it's not getting her anywhere. Until Jesus enters the picture. Jesus who learned obedience by what he experienced. Jesus, who fell every time, and who fell seven times and got up that perfect time. He says, listen, you've had six dudes, but I am the seventh man. I am the perfection. I am what you have been looking for. And it's not just water. It's not just natural water because you don't want to thirst anymore. It's love. That's what this, if, if you've had five husbands and now you're shacked up with a guy, you're looking for love and you're not finding it. Because you're looking for love in all the wrong places. Because until you get to a well that's sitting on a well, until you get to a place where you understand that you're being drawn by the lover of your soul who is seated on the throne in a position of rest, until you understand that he came and got you and it was never even about you trying to get to him, until you understand that he drew you so that you could run after him, until you get to that place where the focus shifts off of yourself and onto Jesus, you're never going to find what you're looking for. And once it shifts, once you, once you find it in Jesus, then you'll understand that, that you've had it all along, but you just couldn't receive it. God has loved you forever, and He will love you forever. There was never, ever, ever a time when God didn't love you. No matter what you did, no matter what you said, no matter what you thought, it doesn't matter. God has always loved you because that's who He is. He can't do anything else. God is love. That's not something that he does. That's his definition. So Jesus is saying, listen, I'm what you've been looking for. 
So you, you're, you're right. You've had all these different experiences. You've had all these different men. You've looked for love in all the wrong places. You've tried to draw from the well, and it's not going to satisfy you because it's not living water, because it's rules and it's not relationship, because it's old covenant, which is law, and it's not new covenant, which is grace, which is literally the blood of Jesus flowing in our veins. So in verse 19... The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. So, so Jesus tells her, you know, you've had five husbands, and the guy you're with now isn't a husband. And she goes, oh man, you're a prophet. You know stuff that there's no way you could know. And, and again, here's the key. He wasn't condemning her for it. He was saying, I know what you're going through. He's saying, I've done this whole human experience. And obviously, you know, Jesus didn't marry a bunch of people. He only married his bride. The, the Lamb's wife, the church on the cross. But again, it wasn't until she saw herself as a widow. Because that's what he said. That's what this woman said. She, she said she's not a widow. She said, you know, I'm married. I have a husband. Or, or again, I've had a bunch of husbands. And, and the guy I'm with now is not my husband. I'm stuck in a relationship. I'm caught in a place where I think I have to do these things. And Jesus said, well, guess what? I'm here to change everything for you. Guess what? I'm here to give you what you've always been looking for by, by giving you the ability to receive it. She says, so, so he's a prophet, but he's not an old covenant prophet. He's not a prophet who brings sin to remembrance. He's a prophet who takes away the sin of the world. And he says, all of that stuff is in the past and it doesn't matter anymore. I've forgotten about it. Now here's the deal. You need to forget about it. And the only way that you can really probably forget about five other husbands and a sixth man is if you finally get to that seventh man. If you finally have something better and then you're not looking back to what you used to have because who cares? When you find something better, everything else just fades away. When you find a more excellent way, everything else just doesn't matter anymore. All of the things that you thought you wanted, all of the things that you did in order to get what you thought you wanted, they, don't, they, they lose their importance in the face of the beautiful, glorious love that is God. So in verse 20 she says, Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she's, she's kind of trying again to call him out and say, Well, I believe you're a prophet, but, but then why does the law say this? Which is what we do so many times in this Christian life. We say, well, hold on, if you're supposed to be a Christian, how come you're doing this? If you're supposed to be a Christian, how come you're saying this? How come you're doing... You know, how come you're acting the way you're acting? And, and again, my response to that is, well, you know what? Whether or not I'm acting righteous, I am righteous. And the more I, fight, the more I figure that out, the more I believe that I'm righteous, the more I understand what it means to be righteous, then the less I'm going to do all that stuff that, that I really didn't want to do in the first place. When I'm fully and completely satisfied with Jesus, I don't need to satisfy myself or, or, or try to satisfy myself in other ways. And then Jesus says this to her when she starts calling him out again on the rules. In, ver in John 4, 21, Jesus saith unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain, Mount Sinai, nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. So he's saying it's not about all of this stuff. It's not about the old covenant. It's not about these rules. The hour is coming and it's coming quick when everything is going to change. And of course, the hour that he was speaking of was the cross, which changed everything. He says in verse 22, Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. He's saying, what are you even talking about, about worshiping stuff? You're a Samaritan. You're a woman. Why are you trying to put yourself under the law that really doesn't have anything to do with you? At least we know what we're worshiping. At least we understand the rules that we're trying to follow. And then he says, but the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Worshiping God is not about what you do. It's about knowing the truth. It's about worshiping in spirit. It's about letting Jesus, who is the true worshiper, worship in you. It's not about saying, you know, oh God, I'm, I'm, I'm so pitiful, I've messed up so much today, and, and causing all the separation between us. True worship is saying, yeah, Daddy loves me. I'm convinced that that should be 
how we worship. Thank you, God, for loving me. Period. That's where the focus needs to be. And in verse 24, Jesus says, God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. We have to relate to God as he is. Not as we think he is, not as he's been misrepresented to us, but if he's spirit, we got to worship in spirit. We have to let his spirit worship him in us. We have to just simply receive from the Father and then release it. Because that's how we give it back to him. Jesus says, you love me by loving each other. He says, you've given me a cup of cold water when somebody else was thirsty and you gave it to them. That's what true worship is. It's just simply receiving his love and then just releasing what we have. Just letting that uh, river of living water spring up inside of us unto everlasting life. It's not about doing anything. It's about receiving from God. So in verse 25, the woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. And then Jesus says what he always said when people said, you know, the resurrection, yeah, yeah, Lord, I know the resurrection is going to happen someday. Jesus said, I am the resurrection. The Pharisees said, you know, you're not even 50 years old and you're trying to talk to us about all this stuff. Uh, you're trying to tell us about Abraham. And Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Jesus said, listen, what you're looking for is right here. You can't find grace unless you find it in the eyes of the Lord. He says, uh, in verse 26, Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am. And, and in the King James it says, I am he, but the he is in italics. So again, Jesus is just simply saying, I am. He says, I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who's coming, and I'm here. And that's why he said in verse 23, the hour cometh and now is when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. He says, the worshipers here, guys. Now things are different. And real quick here on the cross, you're going to come into me, I'm going to come into you, we're going to be one together and one with the Father. And all of this garbage that we've been so uh, looking at, so focused on for so long, it's not going to matter anymore. You're not going to worry about how many times you fall down because you'll understand that I got up the seventh time. I am your perfection. You don't have to act a certain way. You just have to worship in spirit and truth. You just have to know who you are, and then everything else flows from there. So I want to close with two verses in Jude chapter 1. And I think that this really dovetails with what we were talking about in Proverbs 24, because here's, here's almost the problem that we mostly find with grace is people accuse grace of being a license to sin. People accuse grace of allowing you to live any way you want to live without consequences. And, 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 and I, can, I can see that, like I can, okay, you can do whatever you want and God's not going to be mad at you, but, but grace is so much more than that. Grace is so much bigger than that. And that's what it says in Jude chapter 1 verses 24 and 25. It says, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling. Jesus got up the seventh time. You don't have to fall anymore. You don't have to focus on falling anymore. He's able to keep you from falling. He is the way. He is the path. And he is the one who walks on the path. You don't even have to try to walk it because you're in him and he's walking it out in you. So he can keep you from falling. If you keep your focus on him, you're not going to get bogged down with this stuff. If Jesus is holding you up, nothing and nobody can drag you down. It says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. If Jesus can't present me faultless, nobody can. I can't do it. But here's the deal. He already did it. And that's why he can present us faultless. That's why he was able to present us to himself as a bride without spot, wrinkle, or any such thing. Because he got rid of all the spots and the wrinkles. Because he revealed himself to us. He showed us, the, literally, he showed us the, faith of the, the face of the Father. He said, this is what God looks like. It looks like a man loving other men. That's what God is. And that's who you are because that's who lives in you. So it's not about your faults. It's not about your sins. It's not about falling. It's not about any of that stuff. Grace doesn't let you fall. Grace lets you, grace lets you believe that Jesus can keep you from falling. 
Grace lets him live his life in us. That's what grace to grow is. It's about growing in the knowledge of who we are, not, not, not growing in our actions until we stop messing up, but instead understanding that it's not the mess ups that matter. It's Jesus that matters. It, so it says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. How do we get presented before his presence, uh, before the presence of his glory? Because he does it. And what does that do? It gives him exceeding joy. God is a happy God because on the cross he got everything that he wanted when he got you. And he got you when he gave you himself. And that's what grace allows us to see. That's what grace allows us to, to know and believe. And that's why, again, just like in most of Paul's letters, when, it, when, when he's talking about something awesome that God has done for us, what he's really saying is, glory to God. What he's really saying is, focus on where this comes from, not, not necessarily what this is. He's saying, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. He's saying, guys, if we're focused only on what God has done for us, then we're missing out on, on, on the God who has done it for us. And that's all God wants is to spend time with us. That's all any father wants with his son is to spend time with them, to enjoy them, to have fun with them, to hang out with them. Not, to, not, not always to, 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 you know, to rail on them and, and, and to discipline them. That's no fun for anybody. And, and, and while it is necessary, God did that to Jesus for us and as us. He corrected his own son. He, 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 you know, Jesus was bruised for our transgressions. Jesus was chastised for our iniquities. Jesus took all of the, the, the perfecting, as it were, so that we could be perfect. And that's who we are now. We are perfect because the perfect one lives in us. And the more we begin to believe that and understand that, the more everybody else is going to see what's already true. The more we see it, the more we will be it. And the more we be it, the more others will see it. The more we receive it, the more we can release it. And that's the whole deal of this whole thing, is, is just, just letting Jesus do whatever he wants to do in us. And that's what grace empowers us to do. Grace does not empower you to sin. Grace empowers you to be who you are. That's what it means to be gripped by grace. Amen.